Okay. Um, welcome to just the uh, wrap-up feedback session from the roundtables. I hope everybody uh, had a fun and productive time. Um, so we. So I think uh, each group uh, elected a reporter, and uh, we'll, we'll hear from them. Uh, they'll give a brief report. Uh, and then we'll have time for questions on each one. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping announcements first. Uh, um, there's a few Pecha Kucha speakers who haven't yet uh, spoken to Martin, back, standing up back there. And in particular, if Adrian Stevenson, Jody Double, and Richard Jones could look for Martin during the next coffee break, up right after this session. Uh, that would be grand. And the second announcement is, um, in, in addition to the, the Twitter hashtag for social gatherings, which is, again, RF11social, uh, you're welcome to use the flip chart near the reception for good old-fashioned handwritten messages about um, uh, gathering requests or invitations or recommendations about uh, things going on. Uh, in the evenings. Um, and so, without further ado, uh, is, is Linda here from the Social Media and Repositories Roundtable? Would you like to come up? And what I, what I need to remind all the speakers is to stand near this mic, just um, because it's being recorded and you won't be heard otherwise. <laughs> Okay, um, right, so this is um, our group. Uh, our group spoke about um, social media and repositories. Um, we kind of started off with like a round table where we asked about what everybody's experience was um, and what they kind of expected to get from the session and found that some people were using social media in some way to either to sort of tweet the, the, the output of the repository, um, but most of us were actually looking at ways on which we could um, use social media either for to better engage our researchers, to promote the repository. Um, there was some interest in things like depositing in a repository um, or also um, in, what was the other thing? Um, depositing in a repository or notes um, yeah how to sort of uh, capture social media so to create repositories and um, but those last two we didn't actually quite have time to get on to um, so the first thing with a lot of discussion was around um, how we use um, we can use social media um, to promote what we've got in our repositories and um, Glasgow and Lighten had a kind of tweet button where um, each individual paper can be tweeted um, so researchers can do that. That's a way of promoting their own research. It also allows um, the researcher to feed back and say that um, maybe there's been a, a change to the paper or they want a kind of sort of different information. And that also increases the engagement between the researcher and the, and the repository manager. Um, we had also discussion, I mean, more, actually most of our social media talk was around Twitter which is maybe a sign of the, the times, how you tweet an individual paper, details of an individual paper, should you kind of change the URL, um, or should you perhaps, uh, because it's a very long URL, should you use something like, um, uh, a, like tiny URL to try and create a, a short URL? Um, but we kind of decided against that, really. Um, so that was, that was one kind of method. The other thing about, um, and something which we, we found of interest, is using, if you're tweeting um, uh, individual papers, then that's feeding into the overall impact factor of the papers in the repository. And I think there, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but there were a couple of projects that were mentioned beyond metrics and altometrics, I think, which are, yeah, exactly, which are looking at, um, in REF uh, 14, uh, you have to demonstrate impact and create kind of impact stories. And uh, these projects are looking about how that can be created. Um, the other thing, yeah, we talked about in terms of tweeting is not to mix up sort of the automated processes and also tweet channels in which you're perhaps emphasising something like a, a, an open access paper or something of particular national or international importance, a paper that's de been deposited in the repository. Um, there was also um, sort of discussion about researchers and uh, their um, well, reluctance perhaps to use social media 
um, and see it perhaps as interrupting the research process or changing the research process and the education that we could perhaps do through what we put in a repository of the benefits of using social media, if that's the case. Um, then we moved on to talking about um, using existing social networks or subject-based networks such as Mendeley uh, to uh, both these are, are things which refer to, to uh, referrals to repositories often come from these social communities or social networks but also how we can work with those um, uh, communities in order to kind of make the, the research in the repository um, higher profile. And there was a lot of discussion around uh, usage statistics, how we can get statistics out of repositories. Um, I don't think we came to any particular conclusions about that, but that it was important to get feedback of what was being used and what's not being used. Um, the, also, the other thing was, um, if we're going to be using repositories, um, information that the academics will find of use, so sort of adding value to what's in the repository, so links to the, the academics' particular social network uh, of preference. So they may have their Twitter profile or the researcher ID profile, and that is something that can be added to perhaps the researcher profile page within a repository. And again, that's a, a higher a way in which the researcher um, can raise their profile within the community. Um, Somebody, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Glasgow again, said that researchers or lecturers were interested in having things like links to their Amazon book, their published works um, from and within their profile. So I think the final thing we kind of talked about was um, Google Citation, which has just been announced. I think there was a, a post which William retweeted from um, LSE about how they've been using Google Citation Count and what impact that will have in our own repositories, our repository interfaces, and uh, which is um, Google Citations. It it's kind of takes all the information from Google Scholar and creates a kind of personal profile for an individual. And that personal profile can then be amended. The, the, the researcher can kind of say, this is my paper, this is not my paper. Um, and so that will create a whole kind of new uh, community for researchers. And is that a threat or an opportunity for, for libraries and for repositories? And I think that was it, unless there's anything else. Okay. Don't go too far, Linda, because oh. we'll have, I think we'll do questions at the end, so maybe if you can, you know, take a seat near the front. Um, Theo, are you here? Uh, I, I think we'll do, do all three, and so try to remember your questions for Linda. It's, it's never fair to the first person when you do it this way, but in the interest of going to have coffee on time. Okay, um, our round session, our round table session was really quite short and sweet, um, and it focus specifically on sword packages and what we need for repository deposit. And um, I don't know if many of you know what sword is, um, but it's just a, it's a protocol for depositing content into repositories um, through a machine-to-machine -machine interface. And it stands for Simple Web Service Offering Repository Deposit. And we had a very focused chat on, on what we need, what kind of packages we need to actually put content um, from point A to point B. Um, and the point was that SORD is a very simple protocol based on AtomPub, and it needs to be as light as possible. Um, and if we need to sort of customize it, then with extensions, then you know, you should use that very sparingly. Um, and we sort of initially discussed what the minimum um, data required for um, the transfer is. And the point was that, well, actually, you don't need anything apart from a, a URL. Um, you know, you could just put that into a, a repository and just say, well, there's the data, and it's over there. And that's the kind of very basic minimum. But, you know, we're, we're very concerned with how do we encourage repositories to share, um, particularly when all repositories customize locally, and that tends to inhibit uh, any interoperability. You, know, you can collect a rich set of metadata, but when you pass it over to a repository that doesn't understand it, um, the data is not going to be validated and it's not going to be um, used. So we talked around um, what kind of approaches are required. Um, you know, there was an issue talk about standards and what kind of standards various um, different disciplines use. So um, learning objects might use IEEE LOM, um, Geospatial might use different ones. Um, and obviously standards can be an answer, but generally they're more of a problem. So the way of thinking we came towards was that negotiation would be a better way um, to handle this. 
So instead of imposing yet another standard saying you must use this to understand the data we're transferring, um, any services transporting content could have a negotiation um, whereby the, deposit, the person putting content in says to the repository, well, what data do you understand? And the repository can reply back saying, well, we understand these metadata fields. And then the person depositing the content can deposit the data that the repository understands. So this is particularly important for our repository junction project, which is building a broker. And the broker will act as a piece of middleware that will um, take content from a number of different sources and put it into repositories. So, um, for example, we're going to be working with various publishers who pass us copies of journal articles and metadata. And we then repackage it up and send it off to multiple institutional repositories. Um, so the broker, in this sense, make, makes a lot of sense. Rather than each publisher having a one-to-one -one relationship with many repositories, they can just have a relationship with one broker, and the broker does all the hard work. So building this broker, we're going to have to think very carefully about standards. And the approach um, that was advocated um, to us was this idea of negotiation. Um, so instead of imposing more standards, um, I think negotiation is the key, and that's the take-home message from our group. Thank you. Everyone got that. Remember your questions for Theo. And um, asking, I think, Peter to come up and uh, speak to the, the linked open data roundtable. Just rearranging what it was we said, because if we told you what we said in the order we said it, you wouldn't believe it. Um, or maybe you would. Um, so our topic was linked data and repositories. And in some ways, we should have been saying, what can linked data do to inst for institutional repositories? And what can institutional repositories do for linked data? And we had a go at the first, and we almost had a go at the last bit, but not too much. And it turned out, therefore, into something like a supply-side versus demand-side debate, implicitly, although that was not drawn out, with lots and lots of middle folk controversies, including dark alleyways of the semantics of the semantic web's language, leading one of our number to become nostalgic for the debate about copyright. Um, so... Part of that was whether our linked data was for the metadata or for the content of the documents that were in institutional repositories. Because it was recognized, I think, that repositories um, were full of disconnected objects, except at this trivial level of having some common metadata. Um, that's if you take repositories one at a time. But the trick, therefore, was to see whether or not you could somehow iterate across uh, institutional repositories phrase I hadn't heard mentioned before, but apparently it might become common. Um, so we had a go initially about definitions of and motivations for linked data, um, how um, in some sense it became more the debate about identifiers and about the metadata and less about the content, because there was some hesitation about whether that content was uniformly available for the machines to do anything with. In other words, if the machines can't access the content of repositories, because they're in PDFs typically, then you can't do linked data on this. So this became an impediment for discussion, and then we thought we'd come back up and we looked at the metadata level only. There was an argument, of course, about giving everything uh, a URI and then making the metadata about that thing accessible via that URI. So that was picking up on something that was said in one of the early presentations, and I think it was generally accepted that, hey, that's a good thing. Um, and some useful reference, I think, to uh, content negotiation, uh, which had been around since HTTP 1.1. So it was an attempt to say, well, have a look at that again. Can we make use of that? Uh, but then we went off... Um, into thinking about the motivations as to why institutional repositories should be interested in linked data. Uh, one was that um, linked data was a way in which um, repository content managers could make their uh, content more accessible. So in some sense, another way of advertising what they've got. It's another channel, if you like. Um, 
so that the, 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 the um, knowledge of what's there can be made readily available to others. Um, another some interesting idea was that the, this was a way of putting repositories as a concept, as an activity, on the linked data map. So that linked data map that you see all the time, the same one, well this time it might up there and there might be a little bubble saying repositories. And so hey, then maybe repositories have made it because they're up there. Um, but there was then a debate about um, how to make a start. So how could we get to some base point in using um, uh, linked data? Um, it was ref pointed out that uh, assigning URIs or even publishing the URIs that have already been assigned and minted by the repository software could be the way to go. And uh, pointed out that uh, um, Fedora most definitely did, um, ePrints was doing, and it was thought that DSpace had it in it to do. So in that sense, um, the, the URIs uh, as identifiers for each of your uh, objects are already there. And perhaps even for the metadata fields are already there. We then got into a sort of um, that, 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 that um, semantic argument, if you like, or rather arguments about words, which I must confess I was one of the guilty ones. Um, but a, a wonderful semantic web truth was um, uttered by one of our number, um, that essentially it was all about assertions without trust, and that identifiers and same as therefore were assertions, but not identifiers and not same as. Uh, that's me putting a particular spin on this use of the words identifier and use of the words same as. Um, so there was also a big argument uh, uh, or other uh, um, voice of opinion that one should just do it. And that the value of having linked data out and available far, far outweighed any of the hesitations there might have been. Uh, and in particular it was then pointed out that it wasn't just about using um, linked data for the content but also for the people, whether they're authors or users, recognizing there might be some socio-legal problems around there, and that although names were messy, uh, we all accept that, identifiers um, were ways of um, uh, making it less messy, um, although it was recognized that identifiers for organizations were much, much easier than for the any time, any place people. I think that's probably as much sense as I made of the experience. Um, well, I really want to thank the three note takers. That was, that was an amazing um, shot into the head for those of us who weren't in each, each of them. Um, so hopefully that stimulated a few questions. Um, a couple of people have to go back and get the mics. And if this, the three note takers or if the chairs also want to come up here, could come up to field questions. Um, you'll need to answer the questions using this mic, so why don't the three of you just come back and stand here. Um, and uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, so this is the first one. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, and it's about, I got this from somebody who went to, was in your talk, and that's about um, what you think about people who tweet journals or tweet publications and the fact is that uh, if you're based in an institution you could tweet a journal and it could uh, a publication and it could be closed access mm -hmm. so people can't get any use out of it and if that's the case then people might be more inclined to tweet about open access publications and if in the future we do start using things like altmetrics and tweets and what have you to, ba to, on which to base the impact of the science, mm -hmm. then it surely is going to lean towards an open access model for greater impact. Uh, or do you agree with that or do you think that's just... I have to say I'm good to ask. Um, William Nixon, is he here from Glasgow? Because they're... The I know that shite, wait, who's the one who's actually doing I mean, as I understand it, it was the fact is you could have almost like two separate streams. The impact isn't dependent on whether it's open access or not. But William, you know. Yeah, I think, okay, I would almost put impact to one side. Um, I, think there is, um, I think there is value in tweeting even where it's a non-full uh, non text paper because one of the things that we find is there is a, a discovery element there. Uh, um, as well, I think in the 
I mean, one of the things that um, we need to consider is whether or not we should really, as an open access repository, perhaps we only tweet our open access tweets as distinct from, uh, from not or just as, as generally as a community. Um, but I think the whole question of impact and alt metrics and Twitter and citation counts, I think a lot of that is probably going to be more around you know, some of the work that's emerging with Google Scholar citation and, um, and I think the way in which um, the, the ref is going to be looking at it, it will be looking at it more, um, you know, not to do with, with tweets and various other things, but at the actual narrative level of, you know, impact of research for, um, for individuals. Um, so I think there is value in tweeting whether it is, um, you know, an open or a closed, uh, you know, tweet. And one of the things that, uh, and if someone could confirm this or not, I think anecdotally, I think, t um, you know, that tweeting does actually can have an impact on the rankings and the, the searchability of the content in your repository. And if anybody else wants to chip in, that would be great from our group or otherwise. <laughs> Sorry, I was chairing the group, so I thought I should chip in as well. Um, the, um, the interesting about the closed access stuff is people are still tweeting links to the New York Times and to other things that are behind a paywall. And um, as William's already said, the discovery factor probably outweighs that, but I think there's an expectation management thing. So if we're using um, Twitter as public engagement, then we need to think about curating stuff that suits their expectations. If we're tweeting for you know, every single item that goes into our repository as a... Uh, key alert is a news feed, then I think that's maybe a different thing to doing that public engagement side of things. So I think it's just an expectation management issue as well, because we all know a New York Times link is not going to be clickable right away unless you've got a subscription. So I'll we'll chip in. Um, you talked about um, statistics, getting statistics out of repositories. Did, did anyone mention the Pyrus 2? project. Did anyone? David William? No. Okay, so no. Py no. <laughs> I'll mention no. the Pyrus 2 project. No. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, Pyrus 2 is um, aggregating repository statistics and then normalizing them with the publisher statistics as well. So there might be a, um, uh, the preprint and the actual, the, the, the postprint in the, um, with the publisher. And um, so they're, they're normalizing those statistics, but also in harvesting those um, statistics centrally, they'll provide, they'll do the counter compliance once rather than each and every repository having to do that. And at the moment we're thinking, looking at one of those uh, statistic service type thing at this, at a national level. So um, yeah, so that's just let you know, that was one of the things that we're doing. <laughs> 